everyone, Pam here. It is April 24 today and just popping on quickly before this fabulous chat with Karen Vigors about her new release, Sidelines, which is a little bit of a departure for Karen in terms of the subject matter and the writing to some extent, but still has her beautiful signature description and fabulous characterization. So this is a really good chat. I just enjoyed this so much talking to Karen about the book and the way she created her characters, about the restructuring that she needed to do when she decided to take out a few points of view. It is a multi-point of view novel. And there is also so much writing gold in here, just loads and loads of conversation between us about writing process, characters, how we build our characters, being in a writing group, a whole lot of stuff that I'm sure you will really enjoy listening to if you're a writer in particular, but also if you're a reader and just getting an insight into what goes on behind the scenes when you're writing a novel. So stay tuned for that. I also wanted to let you know that I do have one place available on my retreat coming up on May 16 to 19 at Karawina House, which is an absolutely gorgeous venue at the foot of the Blue Mountains in Karajong. Unfortunately, one of the students has had to pull out and there is one spot available, but you'll have to be quick to grab that because I need to have numbers in the next kind of week or 10 days. You can find out more information about that on my website, pamelacook.com.au on the courses page. Just click on the next chapter, writing retreat. The retreat is going to be all about uh, taking your writing to the next level in terms of really putting your characters under the grill and heightening emotion, tightening your plot, thinking about whether you have the right structure or not, writing blurbs. We're going to be doing some blurb writing while we're there. So there's going to be a whole lot of things covered. It's a fabulous group of women that I have coming on this retreat. I'm so excited to be doing this and to have some amazing writers coming along uh, and very honoured to have them there. It's fully catered. It's a beautiful location. You get to hang out with fabulous writers, work on your writing and really have some time away to immerse yourself in the whole process. So would love to have you join us. Do pop on if you're interested and check out that one spot that's left if you're a writer and looking out for a writing retreat. The other thing that I've got going on at the moment with the podcast, which I'm getting some fantastic feedback on, is my Diary of a Procrastinator. So these are very short videos, up to 10 minutes, but usually around five to seven mark, which are going out a few times a week to my Patreon family supporters. And it's pretty much me documenting my process, warts and all, as I write my new novel. So I talk about my tendency to procrastinate, how I overcome that, what I'm doing to try and meet my deadline. And there's a whole lot of writing process talk in there as well about the last few posts have been covering things like deciding on the inciting incident, upping the stakes, making sure that there is enough at stake for the character to sustain the whole story and a whole lot of other things. I would love it if you would like to sign up for the Patreon program. There's also a monthly newsletter that goes out to those peeps and you can find out more about that at rightsforwomen.com on the Patreon page. It's the price of a cup of coffee a month, so around $5, and there's a whole lot of other benefits to being a Patreon family supporter as well, which you'll find if you click on that link on the page. But another thing that you can do is to have me critique your first chapter and send you a video of me talking about that, which will go out to everybody in the Patreon family. And that's always a great learning process as well to have your work critiqued. So don't forget, if you are a Patreon supporter, that is an option. You also have the option of coming onto the podcast as a guest I recently had Renee Black, who approached me as a Patreon family supporter. And of course, Renee's fantastic uh, novel, Red Dirt Home, was out recently and she was on the podcast last week. Would love it if you would check out those options on the Patreon page. Shout out to everybody who is following on Patreon and to everyone who is commenting on the posts that I'm putting out, Diary of a Procrastinator. So I think that's about it for me this week. I am getting some words down, which is great. Yesterday had a big day, 3,000 word. I need to keep up the momentum and keep the story flowing. So I will keep you posted on that. 
So let's get on with this chat with Karen Vigors. She's such a fabulous, experienced writer and talks about the writing process and her process so articulately that I'm sure you're going to enjoy this episode. See you next week. Okay, so Karen Biggers, welcome to the Rights for Women Convo Couch. Thanks for having me. Lovely to be here, Pam. It's great to see you. And I was trying to work out how long ago it was that you were last on the podcast. You spoke to Kel because I think I was originally supposed to interview you and then I had laryngitis or something, vaguely remember. And I think that was for the Orchardist's daughter. So it was some time ago. It has been a long time between drinks, actually. The Orchardist's daughter came out in March 2019. This is the longest time I've had between books. For some people, COVID was a good time for writing. It wasn't so easy for me. I had a teenager and a son trying to do his first year at uni. He was at home, had to come back home as well. And then we had a few deaths in the family and life just gets yeah. in the way sometimes. So hopefully I'll be quicker with the next one. Oh, excellent. It's been fabulous to read Sidelines, which I have a copy of here, this lovely cover. Good. I'm glad you like the cover. Yeah, I want to have a chat to you about that. And I love the title stands out so beautifully on there too with the yellow font. Really great. So there is so much to discuss in this book, Karen, and I can't wait to get into it. And lots of writing chat that I want to throw at you as well. But let's start with Sidelines. We'll get on to that first. Can you tell listeners first up what it's actually about? So it's a novel, of course, and it's about teen sport and parents living vicariously through their kids, I suppose you could say. It starts with an ambulance on its way to a field because somebody's been injured at an under-14s game and you don't know who that is or what's happened to lead to that moment, except that you do know from the blurb on the back of the book that there has been a brawl at the game. A brawl, oh my gosh, how could that happen? (laughs) So then the novel casts back nine months and it follows two families right through from trials, through the season, through home and family life, right up to that moment of that incident. And then it moves forward from there to look at the impact on those families and particularly on the young people playing who are playing in the game that day. So it's written from the perspective of three parents and three teens because I wanted to get right inside their heads. And six is a lot of characters. So we'll probably talk more about the structure later. Mm -hmm. But any of your listeners who have read The Slap by Christos Chalkas, the structure is similar to that. So you get a good section from each character, but you only see their perspective once. And yeah, the two different families are a middle class family with they're quite well off with both parents as lawyers. The father is particularly competitive and likes to win at everything, whether it be a game of darts or an argument. He thinks that learning how to win and how to have success through sport is the key to having success in life. There are people like that who exist. And his wife, Jonica, is trying to smooth the way for her twins, Alex and Audrey, is a girl playing in a boys team. And so that's particularly pertinent. At the moment, when so many young girls playing soccer in particular want to play for the Matildas like Audrey does. Yeah. And the other family is a Greek family. And the mother could have played for Australia when she was young, but life got in the way. And so now she's her daughter is also playing in the same team and she's trying to pave the way for her daughter. And the other character is Griffin, who is a bit of a disruptor. He's actually a natural and he joins the team early in the season and upsets the entire social hierarchy of the team. So, yeah, there's tension within and between teams, within and between families. So it's a ripe area for exploring lots of family drama issues and coming of age issues. It certainly is. That's such a great summary of it, Karen. You covered everything so beautifully there. I have to ask first up, are you a football fan yourself? I never used to be, but when I met my husband, he was an ex-professional footballer. He's a scientist and he works at the ANU. He's a forest ecologist because he realised early enough that he wasn't going to have a successful career as a professional footballer. And when we had kids and we lived here in Canberra in suburbia, I had grown up riding horses, but he had played team sports and particularly soccer or football, as he would call it. That's what our kids started to play. And so I became a soccer mum and I had 14, nearly 15 years 
of standing on those sidelines myself, watching my kids play and also referee soccer. Not a soccer player myself, but I have had to, I have watched lots of, I watched the Women's World Cup and I've watched lots of games in the previous Men's World Cups and uh, the Champions League. And, but we don't generally get up in the middle of the night to watch, but Early on in our relationship, my husband used to sometimes sneak out to watch some of those games. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was very keen. There's a scene where I don't want to give too much away, but one of the families gets up and the kids are dragged out of bed to watch the game on telly. And I thought I knew the reaction I would get from my children if I ever tried to do that. <laughs> when they were little, our kids, this is not my story. I will hasten to add here as well. Yeah. And it's not my family's story. And my kids, when they were young, were very excited to get up and watch World Cup games if they were in the middle of the night. Yeah, we have done that sort of thing. But lots of families that are really into their soccer yeah. will do that. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. And probably a bit age dependent too. When their, <laughs> Teams are a bit harder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get them out of bed for anything. But uh, yeah, so obviously you, having had all that experience with your kids playing soccer, your husband, soccer, I still call it soccer. I know it's Yeah, let's call it soccer. It's, I, I know it's technically football, I know, but... So is that, because this feels like a bit of a departure from your previous books in some ways in that they were, even though very much still in the relationship realm and communities and things like that, but perhaps not with that environmental or landscape kind of emphasis that some of your other books have. So it did feel like a little bit of a departure for you. Do you see it that way? Or And I'm just wondering what, what kind of led you to write this book at this time in your career? Yeah, okay. So yeah, it is a departure because it steps away from a lot. Most of my books have been embedded in nature and in natural landscapes or wild landscapes. Though I've recently been thinking that playing fields and soccer fields and any sporting field is a, in a way, a wild landscape as well. True, <laughs> can very <be>. true. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a book that I had to write. I think when a writer comes to choosing what they're going to work on next, it works best if it's something that's burning inside you that you really feel you want to explore or discuss. I never want to be didactic in my writing, Pam, but I want to explore issues and different perspectives and different ways of thinking in comparison to mine. So Mm. what had actually happened, though, was that triggered me to write the book was that a brawl had broken out at an under-12s game in my hometown and it was pretty shocking. My daughter could have been in one of those teams because she was had a bit of potential and she had was trying out for a boys team so she could extend her skills as a soccer player. But she was injured at the time, so she missed out. And so in retrospect, that was really fortunate because yeah. what happened was that a couple of teams had a little bit of history. And when I say history, just a bit of tension between those two teams And two boys on opposing teams had started to push and shove and then some fists came out and then a father ran on and grabbed one of the boys by the throat. And another father ran on and a third father, like I would have thought two was more than enough, but a third one ran on and punched the second one and this full-on fist fight broke out at an under-12s game. And I wasn't there, but I knew people that were and the news got around quickly. The kids were really upset, really shaken. You don't expect to yeah, see can imagine. parents lose control at a kid's game. And so I started to think about all of that, what was underlying it, how parents could get so invested in seeing their kids win in the outcome of a game that it could end up with a full-on brawl happening. Mm. And so that's when I decided to write the book. Mm. And by that time, both of my kids had stopped playing. My daughter she played I've seen them play from grassroots and my daughter played at a fairly elite level and my son was also a ref and I'd watched him have subjected to a ton of abuse from parents and coaches from the sidelines and so I wanted to use fiction and use fictional characters to explore some of those issues and what the impact on the kids was of that sort of behavior. Yeah. I think you've really tapped into a vein there that a lot of parents will be familiar with and kids. Like, I think it's a story that appeals to across the ages, really, because I've never had a lot of experience with elite sport. We, like you, had horses and my girls did a lot of pony club, but my, and there was a little bit, a fair bit of competition in that, I have to say, but one of my daughters was an A-grade netballer for a little while, managed (laughs) to work her way up to the A-grade team. And that was just eye-opening for me in terms of I think parents at any level can be competitive you don't necessarily have to be in those top 
grades, but I think it's intensified. There's a lot more at stake for the parents and the kids, isn't there? When, you know, there's, will they get in the team? Will they stay in the team? And all those things, that tension, which you capture so beautifully in the novel. Yeah, there's lots of pressures. And I wanted to explore that line between parents supporting and encouraging and being there for their kids versus putting pressure on them. And when that pressure can go too far, like where is the line? Where, is there a line or is it, is, do you have to leap over a gap? And then how does that impact on the young people in terms of their enjoyment and ongoing mm. participation in various sports? So when I wrote this book, I thought I was writing about sport, but really it could be any competitive activity from swimming to ballet, basketball, music, parents that want their kids to win at a Stedford's, even academia where parents want their kids to get straight A's. Mm. So I was really interested in the fallout of that pressure and and looking at why we've become so intense about it all these days. I think competitiveness has always been there, but this investment these days in winning and that seems to be the only measure of success for some parents, whereas for a lot of kids, just getting to the game is success. Getting in the car and getting there can be success. So, yeah, it's really, it was a really interesting field to explore in this book. Yeah, I can definitely vouch for dan- for the competition in dance. The same daughter that did A grade netball did Stedford dancing, and that was a whole other world as well. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a bit about dance mums. <laughs> When I was glad to leave, I can tell you. So I just wanted to maybe focus a little bit on the characters. So you, as you say, we've got six different point of view characters. So we get to see exactly how all these tensions affect each of these individuals. And the story starts with Jonica, who is the mother of Audrey, the mother of the twins, actually, Audrey and Alex, who both play. And she's, again, I don't want to give away spoilers or anything, but she, even at the beginning, is the voice of reason to me throughout the story, isn't she? She's, of all the parents, she seems to be the most low key about the whole competitive side of the game they're playing. Yeah, I guess she's the one, because she's a stay-at-home mother, she'd like to be at work. Having twins was a bit of a shock, which I imagine, I've always thought having twins would be such a an explosion in your life. <laughs> yes. And so when it was time, for, she's a solicitor and when it was time for her to go back to work, it all seemed a bit too much and her husband was supportive of her staying, husband Ben was supportive of her staying home for longer. And then somehow that's turned into 13 years of being at home, which can easily happen. And so she's the closest. She's trying to smooth the way for the kids. And in a way, I think she's trying to protect them from Ben's pressure and competitiveness because he's a full-on barrister. He's a sort of criminal lawyer and full-on barrister and he as I said before, likes to win at everything. So he pressures the kids. And when he, there's that, for him, I think there's that issue. I know we're talking about Jonica, but when he comes home from work, there's that issue of separation. Like often it's difficult to separate. If you come straight home from a busy day at work into family life, Mm. it can be difficult to separate. And he walks in when we first meet him, like he's walking into a courtroom. And so Jonica is aware of all of that. And so She's She is a kind of voice of reason, though I didn't plan her to be that way. She sees more closely the impact on the kids of her husband's pressure. And she's yeah. a lot of mothers do take a lot of stuff, deal with a lot of stuff that they wouldn't just to smooth the way for their kids and for themselves. And I guess it was exploring that through Jonica. Yeah, yeah. And that role of peacemaker that she is in yeah. the family, isn't she? And like the glue, I think that word is actually used at one point to describe her in the family. But Ben is an interesting character as well. As you say, he is the most, he's not the most competitive, but he is very competitive. And I, he, there's this relationship he has with his brother, which is really interesting, Darren, who isn't a point of view character, but we see the way that historically this sense of competition has really been with them for most of their lives, hasn't it? Yeah, and I think that's not unusual, sibling rivalry of that nature, especially two boys that were fairly close in age growing up together and competing with each other. And Ben's always had to be top dog and his brother Darren has always resented that. So now it's all, it's all the kids are on different teams, but it, it's playing out through, vicariously through their kids, their competition with each other. So that was another thing I wanted to delve into that whole thing of sibling rivalry and there's a bit of a little bit of it there between Audrey and Alex as well Mm -hmm. because Audrey is now trialing and then plays on the team with Alex which was Alex's team until this year and he's not very happy about his sister being there 
And yet they have a, a slightly different bond because they're twins, which might have been more frictional, I think, the journey between the journey of the story if they hadn't been twins. Yeah, yeah, oh, yes. And Audrey's so lovely. I, they're all great characters, but there's a couple that I just felt very connected to. And we don't want to go into too much, but the, she's feeling a lot of pressure because of that being on the boys' team. There's obviously the pressure from her father, which is ongoing, or her parents, but particularly her father. I'm curious as to how all these characters, Karen, we'll get on to the other family in a minute, but how did all these characters evolve for you? Are you someone that creates character profiles and things beforehand? Do you, you know, daydream them into existence? Do you learn about them as you write? How does that work for you? I think it's a bit of all of the above. Like I did try doing character profiles for this novel and I had a whole list of questions and I interviewed them my fictional characters. I have to add that because I mentioned that at a talk when I was on the road touring for this book and somebody said, oh, did you have to get permission to use their stories? I said, oh, and I interviewed my fictional characters. Like it was an interview in my head, <laughs> which was pretty funny. But I did interview them and I got some basic information. But I do a bit of planning, Pam, but I don't do too much because I've tried doing that before and I couldn't write the book. I just felt exhausted and mm. bored because I knew what was going to happen. Maybe that's part of why this book took so long. I didn't know everything and it took a lot of time to learn and understand them. And one problem for me early on was that I wrote the first draft fairly quickly and I wrote nine characters and oh, initially wow. yeah, nine characters. I wrote that in 10 weeks. I just poured out of me. So without a lot of planning, but one of the issues was that it was reading as nine linked vignettes rather than having an overarching narrative arc and rather than having proper character arcs. So it wasn't until I realised that I needed to cut the number of characters and go deeper and also I had to work out whose story it was. And once I worked out it was Audrey's story, then I could work out how everybody fitted around her. And, in fact, Ben wasn't in the first draft or more than was several drafts before I worked all of the stuff out and I added him in. He became really important to rounding out the story. He was in there, but mm. not his perspective. And I realised that he was the one who had to probably had to learn the most. Yeah. But I think all of them had to come go some distance to understanding themselves and seeing the, not only the impact of their behaviour on their kids, but how they could better support their kids, how they could be better sports parents, mm. which I guess is what, the underlying, not message, but the underlying issue is for me in writing this book, how to do it better. So we, so that our kids keep playing. I did want to say about Audrey that she is, she is an ambitious young player. She does desperately want to play for the Matildas, mm -hmm. but she's also trying to please her father. So it's very difficult for her. And, yeah, and there's yeah. also the pressure she puts on herself. So you, you mentioned the pressure from her father and other pressures within the team all of those sorts of things, but there's also the pressure she puts on herself. And kids wonder, do. Oh, yeah, definitely. And she's got pressures ha happening from the other kids within the team as well. She's got yeah. a lot going on. They all have a fair bit going on. But as you say, Audrey is really the one that I felt had yeah so much going on and so many different pressures on her. And you captured that beautifully in the way she reacts and how things unfold. I well, just say, isn't it yeah, a hard yeah. time though, being a teenager? There's all oh. these things coming at you. None of us would want to do it again. So I really want, and we forget, I think we forget how complicated and how difficult that, we know it's difficult because we don't want to do it again, but I wanted to remind, I suppose, in a way, some of those pressures that young people are facing, not only at school and from peers and from themselves, also from social media these days, it adds yet another layer. And then sport's meant to be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Often there it's is not. that. <laughs> Did you do a lot of research, Karen, other than your own kind of drawing on your experiences, observations, the stories and things that you drew on? Did you do research into sports psychology and that sort of thing? I did look at a bit of sports psychology. I did read a lot of books by elite athletes about their mm. journeys as well. So I read Andre Agassi's book Open, which was really oh, interesting. Okay. I was interested in that impact of parental pressure again. So his father 
really gave him a hard time training him as he was young. He was the one that had to make it. And that had massive impact on his mental health further down the track. I also read Yelena Dokic's latest book, Fearless, which delves deeper into the impact of her father's pressure on her, which was yep. abuse. And I'd say Andre Agassi's father was in a way abusive as well. The extreme lengths that they went to try and make training to make their kids perform. And it's that's at the extreme level, but it's not unusual for parents to overtrain their kids like that. And I also read, by contrast, Elise Perry's autobiography, The Cricketer. And that was so interesting okay. because she it was the complete opposite. Her family was so supportive, but never pressured her. And to this day, the thing she loves the most is to go down to the nets and throw down a few balls with her father. So I, I thought lovely. that was a really interesting contrast. And I used my husband and all his knowledge about football each section for each character has a little football soccer term at the beginning. And that term, it might be a bit obscure, but that term relates to the character who comes after. So I had fun. That's the sort of research you do when you're trying to avoid writing. Yeah, where, where it I came put... in handy. It came in very handy in the structuring and the characterization. So that's good. Yeah, I was trying to, it took a long time. Oh, I'll just pull out all those 400 soccer terms and work out which is the best one for each character. So you, those are those moments where you don't want to do the writing, so you do the research. Yeah, yeah. Your brain's still working on it, so that's good. True. The other family, of course, is the family of Katerina, who is the other girl that's in the team. She and Audrey both try out and end up on the boys' team, and her parents are Carmen and Ilya. Can you tell us a little bit about that family and how they evolved for you? Well, Carmen was a great character to write. I really enjoyed her. She's she's a bit voluptuous. She's quite sexy in a way. She's comfortable in her body. She's very ambitious for her daughter. She's not meaning to be underhand, but she's trying to find ways to help her daughter get ahead in the team to get game time by volunteering to be the team manager. And that's not to say that all people who volunteer to be team managers are trying to get things ahead for their kids. But I've seen plenty of parents do it for that reason, having the coach over to dinner and things like that. But she's, and she's also concerned about her daughter's awakening sexuality as well. And I suppose that's an issue for her, but she has, Carmen has a strong relationship with her husband, Ilya. I think they have a good relationship and they have a, a more of a power balance, whereas in in Ben and Jonica's relationship, it feels like it's, it's less balanced. It feels like Ben's wielding the power and Jonica's finding ways to work around him. And that does happen so often in relationships, but it feels more equal, though I suppose Ilya is p- potentially the voice of reason in that family. Yeah, that's As Jonica true. was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Katerina's interesting in that she's a lot more... She's more outgoing. She's more. She's a bit more brash, isn't she, than Audrey? And we don't want to give spoilers, but yeah, there's some interesting things happen between the two of them. And of course, being the only two girls on the team, there is that strong sense of competition between them as well. Yes, absolutely. And look, I think Katarina's been brought up in a different way to Audrey. Perhaps Audrey's been role modelled a bit more of the somewhat submissive way that Jonica's managed her relationship, whereas Carmen is pretty forthright and. Katerina is her only daughter, her youngest daughter, youngest child, and is a little bit spoilt. And she's, why not enjoy my daughter? And so maybe the boundaries haven't been as clearly drawn, or maybe that's just who Katerina is. There's, yeah. there's kids that have stronger spirits in a way than others. A bit that's harder to manage true. through those teen years. <laughs> yes, I had one of those. <laughs> I think there's always one. Yeah, there's always one in every family. I like to think so anyway. And then, of course, the other family, really, that we see through the eyes of the young man playing on the team is Griffin. So Griffin's father, Lang, they're a little bit, they're different again from the other two families that we meet, perhaps a lower socioeconomic kind of background, a split family. So Griffin just lives with his dad, Lang, who has tattoos and loves his VB and all that sort of thing. But I love the way that you indirectly, really, through your characters, Karen, you're also examining these gender and class roles to some extent, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Because even though Jonica and Ben's family is a well-to-do sort of upper middle class family, in fact, in a way, they don't behave as well around guide their children as well as Lang, who they judge immediately by his Mm. appearance because he looks rough. In fact, in some ways, he's more supportive of his son than the others. Even though he and Lang and his son Griffin are hopeful 
because Griffin's so good that it might offer them a pathway out of their financial situation. So yeah, I did want to touch on that whole class thing. And it also allowed me the opportunity because in sport, people come together on the sidelines, families come together who normally wouldn't mix in life. Their social circles are separate. And yet there they are on the sideline, sidelines with their kids or go barracking for their kids or whatever. So there was lots of interesting territory to to explore there. So I had quite a lot of fun with that. And interestingly, the characters wrote a lot of those interactions. And I wanted to make sure they weren't cliche. But all the characters have their strengths and weaknesses. And I had to fall in love with all of them to make them really rounded people. I think I was initially too black and white in writing them. I was actually judgmental myself. And once I started to think more about where they'd come from and the experiences that had shaped them, that created them as people, (laughs) as characters, they became much more real and more authentic and more we're able to empathise with them more. I think that's important, even if you don't like them necessarily at various times. If you can understand where they come from, you can have more sympathy for their situation. Yeah, definitely. And I really love the way that we get to see different parts of the story through different characters' eyes because, as you say, we have one whole section from Jonica, then there's another whole section from each of the other characters, and we don't revisit those other perspectives again. So I'm imagining structurally that would have been quite a challenge in a way, Karen. So how did you go about deciding we start, even though it's Audrey's kind of story, we start with Jonica's point of view, the mother, her mother. Did it take you some time to work out order of those narratives and how they were all going to come together? The order wasn't too difficult. Once I'd worked out, as I said before, that Audrey held the heart of the story and when I first wrote, I dived in with Jonica and then went on to Carmen and then went. So that basic order was there. There were some other characters okay. that appeared in between, but when I hoiked them out, then it became that the order of the characters stayed the same. What was important, though, was to be able to, even though we don't come back to Jonica, to see her arc progressing and to see where she ends up so that she does still have an arc So that, I guess, later on through Ben and also Mm. a little bit through Katerina and Carmen as well. So the arcs are still there, but they did take some work to refine them. And sometimes it doesn't take much. It can only take a few sentences from another character's perspective for you, the reader, to see how this particular character has moved, how they've shifted and evolved. So, yeah, that did take some work and some weaving. And I did sit down once I was quite advanced, not when I say quite advanced, once I'd worked out which characters were going to remain in the narrative, I then worked to plot out a character arc for each of them. Then I could go back and have all these papers laid out on the desk in front of me. I'm not a Scrivener person. I should try it. But it was all laid out there and I'm like, oh, this has got to come in here. We need to see this happen with Carmen. We need to see what's happening with her up here in her daughter's chapter Mm. or further on in Ben's chapter. So... Yeah, it was a bit tricky, but it was I felt like the right structure for this novel. Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually picturing as you're describing that almost one of those murder boards with the kind of things here and threads going across. And it's that kind of vibe, isn't it, where you're really picking up a thread that you started off earlier and then making sure that's all as you say, you get that arc for each character to well, actually the- when I'm a vet by trade mm. or by profession. And when I was at vet school and I was working, you look at a disease, this is really interesting, it's a good question you've asked. When I was at vet school and you were learning about a disease process, you would work through step by step. I would do diagrams with arrows. So this is what how it starts to evolve. This is what happens next. This goes to here or the different pathways that, that occurred through a disease. And so I guess <laughs> I'm yeah. not comparing characters to diseases, but when you do a character arc, it's much the same. You Like the character yeah. starts here, then this happens, and that's how they evolve, and then this happens. So it's the same kind of thing I've realised for the first time. So I quite enjoy that. And I haven't done that as a discipline previously as clearly in my previous novels, but I think I will in future because it really did help to map out that character arc and I don't know, I just can't do that early on because I don't know the character. Yeah. I don't know how you find it, Pam, but when I start writing immediately, I might have all these plans in the world, but immediately the character goes, oh, I'm going to do this, or this is what I'm going to tell you about myself that you didn't know and they've shown you. And it doesn't mean you're not in control, but they reveal stuff about themselves 
in those early drafts. So it would be impossible to know all that until you've written those drafts. And yeah. then you can start to figure out the char- the arc that the character's on. Yeah, which is where that whole drafting process is so important, isn't it? And just revisiting it many times until we're absolutely sick of them in the end. But, but that kind of layering process and that revision process is so important. I love it. I really enjoy the editing process, mm. especially there's that point which you will know as well because in the early drafts, I don't know if you find this, but you get to the end and you go back and for me it's a big mess, but also I've forgotten a lot. Yeah. And it takes a number of drafts before you have that glorious moment, even though you're not finished with it yet, but you can hold the whole book in your head or almost in, hold it in yeah. your hands the first time and that's really exhilarating moment because you know yeah. it's going to come together eventually. Yes, finally. <laughs> How do you go with timelines, Karen? Because they're the bane of my existence. Like I just, every time I write a novel, I think, I'm going to get the timeline nailed from the beginning and then I start off all right and then within probably 10, 20,000 words, the timeline's gone out the window and I'm just powering forward and then having to deal with it all again at the end. Oh, look, I'm with you. There are moments where if the momentum takes hold, you just got to go with it and deal with some of those logistical matters and they is important, but deal with them later on. So Mm. I I spend a lot of time, because this novel's set in Western Sydney, though it could be set anywhere, I spend a lot of time looking up, oh, when's the when do, would trials have finished and what date does the season start and how many games have they got in the season? And so if I want this to be happening, like they've got a coast tournament, where can I fit that in? So I did fuss around a lot with the timelines and I was thinking about if the, women, if the World Cup was going to be on, what games would be on and what time of the year it would be and then so where that character needed to finish. Yeah, a lot of messing around with that. Yeah. And you think you've nailed it and then you go back and it's, something changes and you haven't. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Have you got any tips for any writers listening out there that with your timeline in terms of getting it sorted? You do have to check it like, and you do have to go back in fine detail at some stage, but, and be aware when you change things of how easily it can throw everything out and how you have to ensure that it makes sense. And that's something that your editor should also help you pick up but it's nice to have it nailed before you get to that point so no specific ones except that again I like having it on a big piece of paper and sometimes it'll go around here and then take an s bend and go right around to the bottom of a big a3 page and and then I glue it tape another one on I'm very physical I like to do it by hand not on a screen Yeah, I found, I think last year and the year before, both years, I bought those those giant kind of war calendars you can get. I don't even know what size they are, but they're massive. And then I always have these great intentions at the beginning of the year of mapping out. It's one month and then you rip that off and then there's the next month and gets to halfway through the year and I haven't used them. But I found a fantastic use for them is doing exactly that sort of thing because they're really big and I use them for kind of timelines, making So you flip them over and use the back. Yeah, I flip them over and use the back. So they're never wasted. Or butcher's paper. Butcher's, butcher's paper, paper is good is as great. well. Yeah. That's something you can make. I guess. A big mess on. And I at this time too, I did use a lot of mind maps as well with a character in the centre and little yeah. arrows out and little circles around things that happen and then trying to work out the order of things, that even little bits of post-it notes. I don't know yep. if you use those and laying those out to see what order the things need to happen in yeah, and I'm how so. to build that that arc towards yeah. the, the crux or the crisis. Which is so important and brings me back to the point you made earlier, Karen, where you mentioned at the beginning, we start with this, the ambulance being called something's happened on the, at the game. It's quite a short prologue, but we get a real sense of the conflict and the tension and the God, how did this actually happen? And then we start with nine months later. So did that, was that always how you planned to start it with that event and then going back? No, I I didn't have that there to start off with, but the crux comes later in the book, a fair way into the book, probably, I don't know, four fifths of the way into Mm. the book, about that far in. But then I realised that just it would was a better hook to have that at the beginning and to get people thinking about what actually happened. And it makes it a bit of a mystery in a way because you really do not know who's been hurt and what led to that moment. All the little things. So then you follow through those lives and see all the little things that can add together to reach a moment where an explosion can happen And it just takes one thing 
to, for the whole thing to erupt. And that happens in life all the time, doesn't it? And it's yeah. great for fiction. It's fantastic. Actually, very similar to the way Hannah Ritchell does it in her new, newest novel, The Search Party. She's got this kind of prologue where there's a girl, you don't really know something's happening. It's quite dramatic in the prologue. You don't, it's anonymous. And then you meet all the characters from different points of view. So yeah, it is a great hook, but it also is just so good. Yeah. In creating that tension right from the word go. Can I say that at one stage before my last novel, The Orchard of Storter came out, I was helping to assess, there was the ACT Writer Centre, which is now known as Marion, used to run a program called Hard Copy. And one year with the fiction program, I was helping to assess all the applicants and we had their proposal. And we also had about 50 to 100 pages of a manuscript that they were working on. And in going through that many manuscripts, you quickly learned, quickly worked out that the ones that you were most interested in were the ones that tried to grab you by the throat from the start, found some hook, didn't have to be like super action, but they had something within that early part of the book that aroused your interest and made Mm. you want to read on. And I went back and I rewrote the beginning to my book when I had done been through all those manuscripts. So I think it is you don't have to have it all sorted out at the start. And, in fact, yeah. it can take quite a while to work out what the right start is. And in other books I've had to cut bits out and I've had an editor say all of that can go and yep. just start from here. Where And yeah. so you do want a moment of heat in a way mm-hmm. to to jump into the book. And I love that, as you're saying, Karen, when we can learn so much from reading other people's writing too it, absolutely it's, yeah, yeah don't you do that as you're writing a book like I always read yeah. a lot of other people's work I don't copy it but sometimes you see the way they handle something and you think oh okay something like that not the same you're not going to yeah. copy them but it gives you ideas about how to fix things in your own work yes definitely and I love that that you often find those things just at the right time too yeah. when you really need it it's that serendipity type thing at work I think <laughs> Or it's an awareness because you're yeah. grappling with that problem and then you see how someone else deals with it and you go, ah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, you've got the radar up. Karen, just one of the things on a technical level that I loved in the novel was your dialogue. There seems obviously lots of interaction between the characters within the families and then between the other characters. But particularly in those family scenes, you capture so much of the, the character dynamics and their relationship in the dialogue. So is dialogue something that comes quite naturally to you? Do you like writing those scenes? I do writing dialogue, but what you're seeing is the finished product. So it takes a lot of work to get it there. I do love that you can use dialogue to show so much, not only by what characters say, but what they don't say, by what they're thinking, but even subtle movements about the way they rearrange their clothes or if they're tense, you can show somebody smoothing their frock or whatever, like in a school dress or flicking their ponytail. It can tell you a lot about character without having to say it, like having to tell and describe that for the reader, you can Mm. show it through dialogue. So I do love dialogue. I think it's a really powerful tool for for working up character. Uh, You have to pick the scene that you use the dialogue in has to have some meaning. It has to be going somewhere, but you you can actually do a lot with dialogue and I do enjoy it. Yeah, it reads so well on the page and it's so active, isn't it? It just pulls you in. You're this silent listener and observer to these people this interaction between the characters. Yeah, and I think the important thing with dialogue is to read it aloud because you'll see, you'll know if it sounds fake and to pair it back to the basics of what you need and anything superfluous, Helen Garner would say, just get rid of it if it's superfluous, leaves a bit of room for the reader as well. But reading aloud makes, the whole manuscript makes such a difference. When you're at the right stage, no point early when it's a big mess, wait until you, you've you got fairly advanced and then you can hear the rhythm in the sentences and mm. the way one sentence flows onto the next or doesn't or when you've got too many words and it it disrupts the flow or whether you could use an extra one in there you need an extra beat yeah that reading aloud I found that particularly useful this time it's a great tip I think for anyone out there listening the other thing that I noticed Karen is your beautiful prose that you have had in all your novels but I love that the way that you found little pockets of I mean everything is so beautifully written in the book but these pockets of beautiful description where we just have a paragraph where the character's outside watching the clouds or sitting outside and there's a kookaburra or a bird and I thought ah there's Karen's beautiful (laughs) landscape inspiration coming in. It was quite challenging in this book it's the first urban novel that I've written and it's a completely different environment for me to write 
on the the soccer field and within the family home. But I had a couple of moments where my characters do have an escape into nature. And I just remember feeling this great ah, sigh go through my body and thinking, oh, that is where I'm that is where I'm comfortable. But I don't think it's a bad thing for writers to move out of their comfort zone at different times. I will go back to writing about nature, but those bits were, it made me realise just how pleasant and how much I enjoy being able to write nature because it it's what helps me in life mm. and helps to keep me steady and where I go when I need to renew. Yeah, and also that we're seeing those different settings through that particular point of view character's eyes, when the character is in those is in that space, it's part of the characterization in a way as well. Absolutely. Like the place becomes a character in itself. But one thing that I can use as advice for anyone that's trying to write place is that it's not necessarily about including a whole lot of detail, but it's often about the feeling, like enough detail to to locate your reader so that they can have a bit of an idea and make the rest up but also the feeling of a place, like if there's movement in the air, in the wind, or whether when I say sun on the skin, or whether it's it's cold, or and the smell of the grass, like those mm. sorts of things, or the smell of the change rooms when you've got sweaty bodies and the smell of liniment and stinky socks yeah. and smelly boots, like those are the little details that will bring it to life rather than the exact layout of the room or, yeah, or of, of the soccer field, whatever. Exactly. And it just takes one small detail to evoke that for the reader, which is so important. Yeah. And Audrey and her mum laughing about the smell of Alex's boots and or his school bag in his bedroom and that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Girls can get sweaty too. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So Karen, you are, I think, a member of a writing group. Am I correct in saying that? That is true. I've yeah. since my last book, it was just around the time my The Orchard's Daughter was being completed that I joined this little group in Canberra, which has a lovely group of writers. There's five of us. It's a very respectful group and it's just been it's really enriched the writing journey. Writing is still very much a solitary activity as it would be for you. You need mm. that time to go into yourself yeah. and, and retreat from the world and immerse yourself in the ideas and that creative headspace. But once a month we meet the five of us and we have, it's been a lovely supportive group. It's not a judgmental group in any way. We, first of all, we have a little round that lasts about two or three minutes where we talk about what's going on in our lives. And I've found that to be really supportive as well, because you can share things that won't go Mm. further. And often we have things going on that can get in the way of our writing or that burden us aside from our writing. And then we have a writing round where we talk about what we're up to and how it's going. And then anyone who wants to share them some work has sent it out a few days before usually and right. will say what sort of feedback they're looking for. Often it'll be an early draft. Is this working? How does this character feel? How does the language feel? What else could I do? So it is always very positive Uh, very supportive, very constructive, depending on what each person wants. And so there's usually only two, maximum three, that have got something to share at the time. And it's been lovely. It's really helped me on this journey. And we'll just have discussions about plot or about character, all that sort of thing. Do you have a a writing group as well? Yes. So I'm in a writing group called The Inkwell. And so there's eight of us, but generally at any one meeting. So we meet fortnightly, sometimes that ends up being monthly, but generally it's interesting too that we write across all different genres. So there's a couple of romance authors, there's a crime, there's a couple of literary authors, you know, me like commercial fiction, historical. So it's really interesting that we don't all write in the same genre, but I think that actually enhances the process in a way because you're getting a whole lot of different perspectives coming in when you are sharing your work or discussing a piece for critiquing. And isn't that one of the great joys of writing is that there are so many different types of books, so many different genres. There's Mm. plenty of space for us all. It's been a fantastic experience for me and I really enjoy that's one of the great things, don't you think, the community of writers and the, the friends that you develop through talking about writing and sharing those experiences. Yeah, and even this is the first time we've spoken face to face and yet through social media and things I feel like I know I know <laughs> I it was going to say the same community. yeah yeah you all feel like your friends even and you're, oh that's one of my friends yeah it's just had yeah. a book published <laughs> so it's yeah, great yeah it's such a great supportive community and then it's lovely to meet up at festivals and things like that when you do actually get to see each other in person Oh, to do things like this. Or if you come to Canberra to do a book launch, I'd be happy to interview you. So there's ways that you can support each other. 
Yeah, yeah. So anybody out there listening, make sure that you are, if you're an aspiring author or an emerging author and you're, you're at home beavering away on your own, making those connections with other writers is, I think, a really important part. If you don't really want to be in a writing group, you don't have to be in a writing group. But definitely having some sort of connection with people who are just that and doing the same thing. I think one of the values, one of the great benefits of that, Pam, is that you see that everybody struggles. Everybody has periods of doubt. Everybody has periods where they can't work it out. Everybody has periods where they don't know what to do with their manuscript or where they're feeling frustrated or and then they have moments of breakthrough. And I think that knowing that you're sharing that journey yeah. And that even the most famous, most accomplished writers have the same moments. I think that is unifying yeah. in a way. Yes, very reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> so you've just finished a book, a tour for Sidelines. How did that go? Well, look, it was really wonderful, actually. I haven't had the opportunity to do it to this extent before because my family have had kids at home and this is the first time they're out of home for the time being. I don't know for how long because kids are boomerangs, aren't they? They are. But I took the opportunity to go on the road and do a lot of events in different places to connect with readers in libraries and to meet booksellers, do some events in bookshops and things like that. And it's just you spend such such a long time as in your writing cave. I do work part-time two days a week as a vet, so I do get out of my cave. But you do get quite ensconced in your own little world and it's really lovely to go out there and talk to people and talk about books in general yes you talk Mm. about your book but then you share all other books that people are reading and that's been a great it takes a lot of energy but it's been a really wonderful experience I really enjoyed it now I'm back home I just got home a few days ago oh lovely back to the real world yeah I did (laughs) an event actually with Penelope Janu on Sunday Saturday at Goulburn Library and it's just so lovely to meet readers and we did a workshop which was really well attended and just like you say, fabulous to get out there and talk to people about books and writing. Absolutely. It's one of the great joys. Karen, it's been fantastic talking to you. I really enjoyed Sidelines and it was a great discussion on it. I think we covered a lot of things, but there's one thing I always like to finish with, and that is what do you think is at the heart of your writing? No, that's a really interesting question. At the heart of my writing is a desire to explore ideas to explore things that I don't know about or that I would like to know more about, to explore the minds of others and how they may think. I don't know if I get it right, but to try and get inside the lived experience of other people, the lives other than my own. There's also a great drive to create, to play with words, to play with ideas, to find things that work and things that don't, to uncover things about myself, to try and work through those moments of difficulty and doubt and lack of confidence and all of those things and to enjoy that community that we've just been talking about. I think I didn't really know about that so much until recently, but that's one of my reasons for being as as well now. But sometimes I've had moments where I thought I would just give up, that I was done if I was really having a struggle with a book that just wasn't working, I've had that happen with the same book twice. I came back to it and I gave myself permission to give up and it felt like the creative burden had been taken off my shoulders and I thought, oh, that's great. I'm going to go on with the rest of my life and do other things and I won't do any more writing. And then as soon as I gave myself permission to let it go, then these little ideas would come niggling back. So how about you have a look at this? It's It must be innate. It must be a vocation it's an internal drive I don't know if you find the same thing yeah I've had that too and I often berate myself for not being an ideas person because I don't have hundreds of ideas swarming around at oh, one no, time neither do I yeah I generally have one idea that kind of brews for a while and then it takes some time to develop that and then at some point at the end towards the end of that process or whatever some other little thing will just start sparking but yeah there have been definitely moments where I've just thought oh this is, why am I putting myself through this? This is just not, it's not worth it. But like you say, there just seems to be that innate creative drive that we keep coming back to it. And that's something that I talk about with a lot of authors on the podcast. And I always talk to my students about is to be able to write for the joy of writing and for the creative expression and just that expression of yourself and your ideas and your feelings that it provides is 
just such a joy in itself. And if you get published, if you do want to get published, that's icing on the cake, because I think you can get so caught up, you know, and I know I did for some, for a while there, get so caught up in, oh, but I've got to get published. I've got to get this book done. I've got to, it's got to be fantastic so it can get published. And that's fabulous. But coming back to that pure joy of what you get yourself from the writing, I think is such an important thing to remember. And I agree entirely. And just trying to enjoy the journey, because that is is actually where the real joy is, despite the highs and lows, the real joy, and apart from connecting with readers and other writers at the other end, that joy of the journey and the exploration and the uncovering and the discovering, mm. all of those things is the creative life, really. It's the tending of the garden, the creative garden, not just the picking of the fruits at the end. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's such a beautiful metaphor. Karen, the other thing I just wanted to quickly mention to listeners is that you do have a podcast yourself, The Secrets from the Green Room. Can you chat about that? Yeah, that's a podcast I do with Irma Gold. I came into the podcast more recently about 18 months to two years ago. It was initially Irma and Craig Cormick. And it's a, I think it's a podcast for both writers and readers, but we have a little 10-minute chat at the beginning usually about some sort of industry issue that is probably something that we're interested or concerned about or wanting to digest. And then we interview an author, not so much about their latest book as more about their journey Mm. to become a writer and often very experienced authors that can share some wisdom for for other writers and readers. So there's definitely some overlap with your wonderful podcast as well. But isn't that good? We have so many choices out there and different information from different writers and different questions being asked. And it's all really helpful and all really enriching. Yeah, I totally agree. And the great thing with podcasts is that the backlist is always there. So when you discover a new podcast, you can go back and there's so much there to listen to. How many years have you been doing Rights for Women now? I was quite surprised. Australian Podcasting Directory had a a photo up of Rights for Women the other day, which was lovely on Instagram. And I'm sure it said 2017, which actually blew my mind because I thought, I can't believe I've been doing that for this long. Of course, I was doing it with Kel for probably half of that time and I've been doing it myself for probably four years now it has been a while and you do interviews quite often though don't you we only do one every three weeks and we have a break between seasons podcast is coming out weekly and but I did bring on and I have to be honest Karen I have confessed this previously on the podcast I have in the past used it as a procrastination tool (laughs) We all have procrastination tools. (laughs) But then last year I had the brainwave that I wanted it to keep going, all that sort of stuff and be fairly regular. So I've brought on some guest hosts and it's great because they're able to get on. It gives the listeners something different to listening to me, but it's also a vehicle for the hosts to be able to have a little bit of a talk about their books. So if you're ever interested, there's a spot there for a guest host. So let me know. Sure, we can chat. (laughs) Thank you. All right. I'll let you go, Karen. It's been so great to chat and I highly recommend everybody getting out and grabbing a copy of Sidelines. It's a fascinating insight and such a beautifully written book. And thank you, Pam. It's been a joy to chat to you.